Good evening. I'm Diane Fisher, and I'm delighted to present Matthew Baumgartner Grids and Glyphs, the exhibition that my students curated last semester. I think that they did an excellent job and hope that you will agree. Curatorial Issues and Practices was the first class that I taught at Furman University. It was quite an experience. It was amazing for me to combine teaching curatorial studies with art history and in the end coming up with an actual exhibition. This exhibition celebrates the life and work of Matt Baumgartner. It explores his creative process and inner spirit and focuses on how he synthesized grids and glyphs to contemplate the four elements of nature. In the early 1990s, he invented his signature medium he called mud, a thick paint-like paste created with gypsum and powdered pigments that he applied to the surface in multiple layers. Most of the works on display were created using this method. This is the second exhibition organized by Furman University in collaboration with Baumgartner's estate. Working with the estate of an artist whose work is of such high caliber is rare. And for students to gain access to his artwork and personal archives in order to conduct original research is an extraordinary educational opportunity. A week before we entered lockdown for the pandemic, I met Dr. Sarah Archino and Riley Murphy, the executor of the estate at Baumgartner's amazing live work studio in Traveler's Rest. I was awed by the sheer volume of art, tools, books, and notebooks that the artists lived among. Our goal that day was to think of a topic for the exhibition that would embody Baumgartner's entire career. I was not familiar with his work at the time, but I mentioned that I saw continuity that utilized structural grids and personal markings, as you can see in this detail of ischemic oracle number eight. Professor, Arch Professor rather, Archino immediately explained, grids and glyphs. We all agreed on the theme and an exhibition was born. To organize this exhibition, I studied Baumgartner's work in life, figured out how his work fits within the history of art and presented these initial findings to the class as our framework. Not much had been written about him, but we did research. We, we found published articles as well as information on the internet. We also contacted relevant galleries and corresponded with people who knew him during various stages of his life. Fortunately, Baumgartner was a prolific writer. Of particular importance were his artist statements that clearly articulated what he was trying to do and listed exactly who influenced him. Matt provided much additional information about himself through his diaries, cards with favorite quotes and to-do lists as seen on the screen. These artifacts, as well as the artwork for the exhibition, were housed in special collections during the semester. Students who were on campus examined them in person and shared their findings with their peers who were studying remotely. All of the students compiled this information into an annotated timeline, which kept our major findings in one place. The big question for the class was how to present Baumgartner's artwork and our visual story to visitors by honing our concept of the exhibition, considering the audience, and deciding which objects to include on our checklist. We wrote and edited the wall text as a group and planned the physical installation as well as our online presence. This resulted in an exhibition based on four main periods in the artist's career along with supporting sections and materials that the students will present in a few minutes. First, I would like to touch upon Baumgartner's artwork in each of the four sections within an art historical context. Baumgartner's work was influenced by a number of sources, including nature, literature, religion, philosophy, mathematics, current events, movies, and music, to name a few. The artist also rigorously studied the work of his predecessors and peers, 
from which he created a distinctive vocabulary and style. As he explained, his art was the synthesis of two disparate approaches, freeform marks within a formalized grid. Glyphs or gestural marks have always existed. Think about freely rendered Paleolithic cave art, for example. Freeform marks such as brush strokes can be as unique as an individual signature, as in this painting by Pollock, but grids, as art historian Rosalind Krauss explained, only began to appear during the early 20th century, as in this work by Malevich, and soon became, quote, ubiquitous. This happened when artists abandoned linear perspective, which provides an illusion of three-dimensional space. Grids, however, are an organizational tool used to treat the canvas as a flat surface, not as a window to reality. Artists tend to specialize in producing either graphs or glyphs, but some like Baumgartner have successfully integrated the two. In his final artist statement, the artist explained how he has used a uh, quote, underlying architectural armature to anchor, unquote, his glyphs since the late 1970s. In 1980, while pursuing his MFA at UNC Chapel Hill, he created composition number 240. This painting is reminiscent of the Swiss artist Paul Klee, who the artist frequently cited, who was a pioneer in integrating grids and glyphs. Although this abstraction on the left is more grid than glyph, we can see forms breaking out of a rigid structure as in the clay. And we also see clay's bright childlike colors and playfulness that attracted Baumgartner. In 1982, Baumgartner moved to Lower Manhattan where art galleries were popping up seemingly everywhere, fueled by a booming stock market. The artist's rectilinear work was replaced by an animated neo-expressionism, motivated by earlier expressionist art, graffiti, and pop culture. At this time, Baumgartner was fascinated by the brash style of the Spanish artists Juan Miro, Salvador Dali, and especially Pablo Picasso. His Les Demoiselles II, or is it De, is a direct homage to Picasso's scandalous masterpiece Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, depicting five prostitutes in a brothel. Baumgartner emulated Picasso's flesh tone palette and further flattened, abstracted, and disembodied the female forms, the glyphs, in five vertical panels, the grids. In the 1990s, Baumgartner was inspired by the layout of Manhattan and began to incorporate grids into his work, sometimes portraying the elements of nature as seen through the windows of skyscrapers. As emigre Piet Mondrian did soon after he arrived in Manhattan, Baumgartner was inspired by the grids he saw all around him. While Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie looks down on the grid-like streets of the city, Baumgartner's looks across to another skyscraper. Windows in the Sky, number 48, eerily foreshadows the destruction of the World Trade Center in 2001, with the light-colored side as the before image and the murkier side suggesting the horrific aftermath. In 2006, Baumgartner moved to Traveler's Rest, marking the final section of his career and our exhibition. Relentless Variation Number Three recalls Barnett Newman's innovative zips, vertical lines that interrupt a unified color field. To create his zip, Newman placed masking tape on the canvas then painted over it. The zip is slightly more raised than the rest of the surface, suggesting an alternate world. Baumgartner also used tape to mask out the underlying layer but he ripped it off after painting over it. Like Newman, who believed that the zip symbolized man's first gesture, a line, Baumgartner also dealt with cosmic themes, 
a spiritual man. Baumgartner wrote that his paintings, quote, are poetic and mystical acts of faith and passion, unquote. Here, the central vertical panel suggests Jacob's ladder from the Bible or a stairway to heaven, perhaps by Led Zeppelin. There are only lines in this panel as it is sacred and untouched by man-made design while the two plan panels that flank it are dense with the artist's human glyphs. In his work since the early 90s, Baumgartner's paintings contained multiple layers of his mud. Every new layer hid what was underneath, creating a sense of mystery. Even the visible top layer cannot be read. He had claimed multiple times that sharing his work was more important than creating it. The sense of wanting to communicate and hide at the same time is best exemplified in Asemic Oracle number eight. Here, the Asemic writing, script that looks like words but is illegible, both reveals and conceals, as in the work of Cy Twombly, who Baumgartner admired. Baumgartner fits within a tradition of artists who worked in code. Picasso, Malevich, Twombly, and Bryce Martin, all of whom Baumgartner listed as inspirational. So while he absorbed the work of numerous artists as well as sources outside of art, Baumgartner's work which incorporates both grids and glyphs is highly singular. I will conclude by acknowledging the people who assisted with this exhibition. First of all, I would like to thank Riley Murphy who generously lent all of the objects in this exhibition and provided the class with invaluable information. I am grateful to Dr. Archino associate professor of art history, who gave me the opportunity to teach this amazing course and graciously guided me along the way. Special collections librarian, Jeffrey McCullough, who spoke with the class and arranged for the art and artifacts to be on campus, went out of his way to assist us. Marta Lanier, the associate director of the Master of Arts in Strategic Design was also invaluable in terms of coordinating the installation and generating our virtual presence. Carolyn Bass, who as a student wrote about Baumgartner's glyphs and grids last year, helped coordinate this presentation and other materials. I am very grateful to our guest speakers, Serena Bocchino, James Fisher, and Steve Gamler, who enlivened the class and provided fresh perspectives. Other contributors shared firsthand information such as the artist's sister, Emily Borello, Jay Bopp, Jim Kraft, and Ken Schaefer. I appreciate everyone else who assisted, especially Bill O'Connor at Wessel O'Connor Fine Art and Sandy Rupp at Hampton Three Gallery. Finally, I am so grateful to have had such a wonderful class who worked brilliantly as a team. Many of their findings were included in this talk. They will now tell you more about Baumgartner and the exhibition beginning with Sophia Scheibler. Thank you.